I didn't really uh, hit Dr. Penn. <laughs> Come on. But, but he's the guy I need. Because in artwork, there is a certain kind of language, a certain method, a technique, if you will. And we are trying to be inclusive about other kinds of art. In other words, music, writing, to convey this similar kind of spirit. This particular method is, frankly, contrary to modern methods. It's an ancient method. It's time consuming. And it is, as he mentioned, something that you want to make eternal. So works that you have seen in different places that are egg tempera that were done from the 1200s, probably even earlier. And then once the oil people got it, why they expanded the knowledge and it became, you know, moved into oil painting and so forth. So, hi Ava. So, um, I have taken something very old, applied it to something very new, and I am trying to find a progression from, that will lead all of us forward. It's uh, progressive, as he says, it's not regressive. And um, each particular panel is a kind of manifestation of what kind of person I'm in contact with, whether it's a widow, whether it's an orphan, whether it's a child, whether it's someone very old. So if you've seen the images, then maybe you have a few questions and I can help you flesh out the story behind it and what it may mean. Does anyone? Yes, Foster. Um, just on the other side of this wall, the contemplative and the, the, the crucifixion scene? Yes. You have a Greek word? Yes. It's been scrawled into the face. You know, it's, it's primarily important never to do violence to your own work. And so you don't you keep that in mind to yourself. But in this particular case, I just carved in the face of it. And that particular word is used once in the New Testament. And it was given to me by a Greek scholar who spelled it all out because there's a progression of the word. Yeah. And it's very um, it's very total. It's a universal statement. It's got pan in the beginning, but what else follows that? It's everything? Is it just? It is the nature of his work. Oh. Jesus' work. Okay. And this was the fulfillment of his mission. And so it's an all-inclusive, universal description in praise of the Father. But you don't have a translation. I, he, he could tell me. Can, but can you tell me the Greek word? No. <laughs> I've got it spelled out in my notes, and I'll, oh, okay. I'll get back with you. I promise. <laughs> Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, writing is different than painting, and one word's, you know, uh, picture's worth a thousand words or whatever. So different rhetoric, different grammar, and the, the color and the materials in your painting. So you'll include, you'll include gold leaf, and you do stuff. Um, I love the otherworldliness of value contrast sometimes. Uh -huh. You know, like a light that's not any light on earth. But could you talk about color a little bit in your work? Yeah. You know, the, um, the development of color in these paintings is the layered technique. Now, when I start out, it is pure glass, white gesso with maybe eight coats and sanded like a piece of glass. So you put the drawing on there and the places that are going to be dark, you ink them with dark ink. 
Because in the end, everything turns transparent. And those deeper colors will be obscured by that early shadow. So, and tempera has a lot of advantages. I mean, if you work in acrylic, it's like working with concrete. It's just so gross. <laughs> but with egg tempera, the, I mean, there's a lot that could go wrong. I mean, there really is. And so you have to be careful what you do. But what I've ended up doing is by turning the painting after all these various layers, probably maybe 45 or 50 sometimes, and turning it on its face and saturating the entire thing with alkyd resin. What is that? Alkyd, it's a synthetic resin, a modern synthetic resin, and it's oil-based, and it permeates through all of that stuff. It's a fix. Yeah. And it will seal the face. I mean, if you've ever seen Wyeth's a timber painting of that old gentleman in Dallas, has anyone seen the painting? Actually, they've taken it out, uh, out of the museum because it is literally falling apart. And I, when I was up in Dallas, I talked with the curator about it. And she said, you know, we're having so much trouble. We, we don't know if we can save it. But this particular method is a way in which I'm trying to keep those layers intact. Uh, and. Uh, the color choices are fairly remote. In other words, you don't just pick out a blue and say it's, you know, it's a cobalt. You may, you may start with a vermilion and end up with a cobalt. Because the, the opposite of it electrifies the surface. And then shadowed areas become the darker red and then the blue becomes the light and then and also, I'll take a palette knife and make a slurry with the egg and say uh, zinc white. Now, I used to use lead white, but it's really bad. And in fact, from these chemicals, I developed uh, sinus cancer. So uh, they cut me down the middle and took it out until I'm uh, still in one piece. But they're all very dangerous. Cobalt, mercury, you know, everything. So you have to be careful when you're working with them too. And uh, I guess I wasn't really careful enough. But so I'll make a slurry with these things and actually use a knife over the whole thing. And if it's thin enough and you've done a good swoop, I guess it's kind of like shaving, you know, but I forgot <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but, and then I'll take cheesecloth and I'll go through the whole thing. And everything that was done before will begin to creep back up. So you start out with a plan and you have to pretty much stick to the plan in a temper, which is one of its limitations. But people's difficulty with blending the material because it dries on touch, I've overcome using this chief cloth rub down method. And it works pretty good, I think. Do you attach a particular symbolism to a particular color? You know, there is a, a light degree of symbolism. Uh, but for the most part, it has to work aesthetically. And uh, that, I can't say in particular that there is a symbol. But there could well be, yeah. I'm so indefinite. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, but he'll often say, I'll ask him for interpretation, you know, and he'll share what he's thinking about, and then he'll caution me. But next time it might be different. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. That ethereal thing that you accomplish, is that a really, really important Thing for you to consciously accomplish, or is it exactly correct? No, that is that is my desire, because 
if you take these things literally, if you actually regimentally put them in place like a scientist or something, you're not going to achieve what it is we're after. This, that kind of rigidity is something that I, I don't want, either in religion or in my work or anywhere. And it has to be a certain degree of softness. It has to be, uh, it has to be said and implied, but not made explicit. And so there's, that's a big difference, I think. Yes? I just be curious on, there's, there's so many, there's so much information in, in each painting on when you are preparing the idea for the painting. Is, is there any idea that's further developed in the process of actually applying the paint? Um, or is all, the entire idea worked out prior? Uh, you know, I depend, uh, I depend on the spirit for the idea. It's not necessarily my idea. And I am readily attached to whatever idea I get. Because it's going to be a good one. And uh, it's also relatively unformed. But when I see a person and I associate that idea with that person, I say, look, that might be it. Look, God, that might be it. <laughs> so in a way, you choose the person. But in another way, the person emanates the characteristic of that idea. And you say, yes, we can use this. Now, Mrs. Gerla was in there, and she's in the flowered gown, and it's the painting of the widows and orphans, of a person who would be religious, that the minister to the widow and orphan. So she's the, she's the uh, widow, and so Laura Baker is the server to the widow. And so, she met the ideal. She was one of 13 surviving children from the flu epidemic. And her hands darned all the uh, curtains for the railroad journey from Kingsville to the Valley. And her husband was the conductor. So she rode with her husband, you know, from Kingsville to the valley, I don't know how many times, and she would darn these curtains. So he passed away and she's left. And I said, you know, this is such a cool story. And and it's such a such a theme for somebody who wants to serve somebody that has this kind of history. So the person serving learns more than they had ever expected to learn by doing the thing that they were told to do is a religious act. So the ramifications of any idea continue. And they continue in reality. It's not some idea somewhere. These are real people. And so I wanted to convey the, you know, I mean, I, you can't go in there and say, oh, well, these people are saints in the church or something like that. That's, yeah, I don't know uh, what that exactly means, but I do know that people in life have been instruments. Do you ever get with other artists and talk about what you're doing to each other? I mean, not to each other, but with each other in a way. No, this thing is so off track, you know. <laughs> um, it really is off track. I mean, when I went to Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, they just did not want anything to do with me, you know. I mean, it was a New York scene, and, and frankly, I didn't blame them. <laughs> but, so I took the money and went to Europe. And uh, it was just, it's just kind of off the beaten track, really. Uh, but why did you spend so much time in Europe with Rembrandt? You know, at that time in Rembrandt's life, Holland and Amsterdam in particular was a very liberal place, and so many of Rembrandt's ideas are 
commensurate with my own. And, you know, I'm, I'm not comparing myself to him. I'm just saying that the person that is the same is somebody that you know. It's somebody down the street from you. And I, I just like that idea. And he did it so well. Can you talk a little bit about Maria Theodora? Yeah. Um, she is a Carmelite sister. She was taking her final vows. It's, it's, it was April of uh, 2012. Recently. Recently, yes. And so she was from Houston. I went to the ceremony and met her parents. And it's a very sort of private thing. Uh, and it was up in this place called San Cristobal, south of uh, San Angelo. And so, and in fact, they have a room there you can go and stay if you, if you want. So you can enter into their place and, and they'll, you know, make sure that you're equipped and ready to accept things that you'll no doubt hear and see. <laughs> because it's a, it's a spiritual bastion. And uh, they have taken extraordinary vows to no longer enter the world at all. In other words, I offer this space and I mean for this space to be completely separate from the world. And as we work out these money things, it's kind of a chagrin to me because that's not, that's not what it is. It is a free space. And so, it is representative of her commitment and her freedom, this particular picture. And instead of enclosing it in a common church, I put it outdoors, you know, in front of everyone. Because the stones themselves make a kind of reserve, you know. I, it was done at Enchanted Rock, and in fact, on that day, I found the stone that must have weighed three or four tons that looked like the suffering Lord. And, and I took a photograph of it and I still have it. And I thought, well, people will be interested in this because they see tortillas and they see marks on trees. <laughs> but, you know, and for me, that's just one of the meanings of the thing. So. There's the priest who's uh, overlooking the ceremony. There's a young man who's the carrying the cross who uh, rather dispassionately does the, uh, what do they call him, Bill? The young man that carried the cross. Christopher. Christopher. Uh, yes, Christopher. that leads the priest into the right. sanctuary. So that's him, he's a local fellow. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this business that you are going to do a fresco in a chapel in Tustin? Yes. And you know, I was just talking to Mike, and I found my man. <laughs> because we have to bend this design into its form. So you need an architect to do that, and these computers are fantastic, but I don't know anything about them. And you can actually bend it into a cylinder and then bend it into a dome. And then I can put this schematic up onto the wall and trace the pattern and then fill it in with each one of the sections. It was built in 1568. It's a chapel in, near a town called Visano. Uh, the family has approved the design. And we, I was two months there with my wife, Tina. And uh, we came up with this plan. And so uh, they've got to come as a group. And I'm interested in getting people helping on it. So that it's not just, I mean, it, all those guys had a team of people. They didn't do it by themselves. They didn't depend entirely on themselves. They worked with others. And, and as a team, they can, they can put these things forward. So. Uh, it's it's coming along real good, as far as I can tell. Yeah, the cartoon is done. The cartoon is on the wall. 
No, oh, the cartoon, meaning the thing that will eventually fill the wall, which is about this wide and about this tall, is done for the most part. It, it now, we figured out that it has to have two regions on the left and the right uh, because we couldn't fill the cylinder on the apse wall. So I contacted this religious group uh, near San Gimignano, which is where it is, and I, we went to services there on the Thursday before Easter, and these monks got out there in these pristine and beautiful white robes with very, very thick cloth. And they would kneel on either side with a, with a lit candle. And then they gave oil to the people. And the people would come and be blessed by the oil. And I said, oh, we've got to do this. We've got to put them on the left and the right. They're dressed in white and we'll exchange the lights for palm branches. So I, these kinds of ideas like come to you because you know you read Revelations and you know that they're, they're dressed in white and they have, but it's it's symbolic to some degree. But uh, and they said no. So the well, brothers there, the, well, the brothers, yeah, said no. they said no. We don't. But let me show you what was done in the past. We're not talking about the past anymore. <laughs> We're talking about this progression. We're talking about how the church needs to move forward with these ideas that are creative, that are not strict or black and white. And uh, I think there's a great deal of hope in it. I hope you agree. So please. Please go into a chapel in Port Aransas or Rockport. Okay, so you're you're getting all the history out of me then. Finally. <laughs> so at the beginning of this thing, I was a, a, a dejected person. I didn't like myself. I actually hated myself. So. I got over those problems on my own out in Port Aransas where I couldn't be get bothered anymore. And it's kind of a good place to do that, you know, land's in kind of deal. And, you know, I spent a lot of time and uh, finally a friend of mine started reading the Bible with me. And uh, he was very liberal and understanding. His name was Francis, Glenn Francis. and. I began to realize, uh, I began to realize something was wrong about me. And I couldn't really change that. <coughs> and I remember going down to Port Aransas Strip there one time, the stretch, and the seagull came and busted through the window. And I had, uh, after having read this, gospel that my friend introduced me to, I was going to this open-air Catholic church on the island, and I killed this bird on the way. And, uh, of course, for years, I didn't know why it happened. But then I read about how, in the Old Testament, they would bring a sacrifice for forgiveness of an innocent creature. And so that was, that was my sacrifice, to be able to enter into worship. And, and at the time, you don't really know that. I mean, you've got so many problems. <laughs> but, you know, I had help to get through them. So that was, the, that was my first initial statement. That chapel was still there. And Robbie uh, Felder, we had an exhibit down there uh, a couple of years ago. And so it's still there, and people really like it. We just installed some new stained glass and windows in there. So that was the first episode. This is the second. So the Italian thing would be the third. Thanks. Yeah. That was Did you say it was an apse? Yeah, an apse wall. Oh, it's an apse wall. So it's yeah. a rounded wall. Rounded and dome. Yeah. Yeah. Can we ask them our question now? Yes, yes. 
This is the first time I've been privileged to see the icons in the chapel as well. You know, I've never seen them assembled as a total group and placed in the chapel. And it seems to me like there's a dramatic difference in how people experience them in the chapel as compared with just put on the wall like in a standard museum experience. And we'd like to understand more about how people experience that difference. Is that something you can share with us? Do you see it as different, Andrew? Uh, when I installed the, the chapel with, with you, um, I had a moment to kind of have a quiet moment by myself with it. And it became an embrace. Uh, it became comforting. Um, there's something definitely different about hanging a uh, traditional show, white walls, pieces with enough space around them, yada yada. Um, but in there, it became a hug and warm mm -hmm. and calming. And uh, but I love it. Absolutely love it. You know, it is, you know, I was explaining earlier how I didn't like myself too much and and I, I had trouble kind of getting over that, and I still do, but what I experience when I'm painting is a complete forgetfulness of myself. <clears throat> and it's so comforting to me. Now, I may only have, after working all day, four or five words to say in a prayer. So you work very patiently, carefully, and then you have a few things to say. And so that kind of minimal feeling of being involved in something, realizing something, and feeling good about how it reflects. You say to yourself, gosh, I look better than I did, <laughs> even though it's someone else. So I guess that's a kind of, uh, some kind of psychological feeling. Now. Bill knows more than I even how to extrapolate what those spiritual things are. In other words, I may work on a painting and do a hundred different things in my mind and do them in front of me, but when I have to go and explain that to a student, it would just take me forever. I could, I could never get there with them. But I mean, I would try. But I'm doing so much that I can't explain it to myself. Much like the idea. The idea may not necessarily be my own idea. And so, when I'm working on the little girl and the pony, when I go to use her in the picture, and I say, you know, Mom, let's get her up on the pony here, and uh, we'll take some pictures so that we have, you know, a degree of you know, spontaneity in it and so forth. So when she sits for the photograph, this incredible trouble just clouds on her face. And I realized that, uh, so I asked the mom, I said, uh, Is Mar how's Marissa doing this? She said, well, me and her dad just were divorced. So I thought, well, you know, and my parents were divorced, so I thought, well, we can use this trouble. So she's receiving premonition of her flight into Egypt. And she's troubled by it, but she will recall the confidence and warmth of her father, Joaquin, in the midst of it. So she's tying her later life to her childhood and she's also becoming a complete person. And uh, I think it was a kind of a beautiful story and it all came from this troubled look, you know. The one that I know. So you feel these inspirations coming through yourself. In the midst of it's being done. And out through your and, hands. And even in the painting of it, it develops. It's selfless. 
Yes, that's correct. And without ego. Without ego. And there, and there is no time. No time. No, you're trying to bridge time. Yes, it's how Mary can have the premonition. Right. There, that's exactly right. Thank you, Margaret. Right. Thank you. Yes, Sylvia. I don't need to talk about this, but um, your subjects are temporary. Yeah. And they're, and they're very diverse. And how, how do you choose <coughs> your subjects? How do you choose this is a person? I'm like? You know, I don't really like. You know, I'm not. I'm not like choosing a race or anything. Uh, now, it's a common. Uh, it's a common. Uh, custom for children to ride a pony on Easter or something, right? I mean, it's everybody does it in the little towns, you know. So then somebody, some man comes with a horse and they ride the pony for Easter. So it's not far at all from what it is they, people actually do. I know that with Miss Rose, uh, she and I were janitors at DPS. And you know, I just, I had this job and I had health insurance and I would sweep the floors and listen to the walkman on my, you know, and it was the greatest job. I used to think, well, you know, Van Gogh should have had a job like this. <laughs> <laughs> because you, it's completely, you know, <laughs> you're in like nowhere, you know, and unless you get chewed out by, by the, so Miss Rose did the did the toilets and I did the floors, and most of these subjects are subjects that I choose over time. In other words, I don't just sit down and say, you know, let me take your picture and let's use you in this. No, it's it, because you're making as many observations without a camera as you are with one. If you're in contact or conversation with somebody, there you can see all kinds of stuff about who, the makeup of the person and everything. So I'll take different things from different places. I hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's the impression I got when I was looking at your work. Uh, because I had also seen some Rembrandts and, and I can see that in there. And I can also see Titian and Turner and create a sense of atmosphere. Yeah. And it's almost kind of zen, you know, it's, it's both things. It's the, the background and the foreground at the same time. Huh. Both and. Well, you know, when you introduce a thing like gold, you really change the aspect. And even though I'd love to paint just, you know, ordinary scenes and landscapes, it's really fun to do. It's kind of like fishing. <laughs> but... When you are working in the studio like this on a very, on a thing that takes a lot of time, that's requiring technically, that's going to have a weird background on it, everything is kind of different. So those are really kind of the two major modes of, of my working life is being out in the landscape and doing it and having fun, and the other just, you know, buckling down and getting it done in the studio. It is a real discipline. Yeah, Foster. I don't know how to frame this question, but it has to do with scale. Uh -huh. Because when I, I have impressions and my intellect as well as my spirit and my eyes, I have various, I'm involved with it. But the more I look at a painting, I see finer and finer details. And I guess that's just meditation, but the line is so exact and so tiny. The texture is, is there, I mean, I don't know. So tell me The fine episode. line, where is the fine line? Well, in, in Maria Theodora, the, uh, the texture of the rocks, I mean, you uh, never stop looking at them. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're well developed. <laughs> and then something else you have, little. Fine line, do you use a one one hairbrush and makes it a fine line? And why does it, it, well a friend, I once, after going in a boat said, why does the randomness of nature seem orderly and not 
friends said, no, it's what is the orderliness of nature seeing random. Uh -huh. So that's the fineness. I didn't know if you could say anything about it. Well, the method of conveying something that's complex, that ties in foreground and background, that involves emotion, uh, that has to do with color choices, that is representative of a real person. All those things have to come to bear. And uh, so maybe that's why it takes a long time. But there are, there are, the sable brush is the most incredible brush. And you can get little bitty ones. And uh, I go through them like crazy. Because I do use a little brush quite a bit. Okay. But you don't use a pen on top. It would be no, a brush. No, no. Uh, the paint remains soft for more than a year. It has to. It has to dry for a year before it gets varnished. That alkaloid rosin you were talking. About. No, the egg temper itself. The tip. The, but I mean, you have paint. to wait a year before you put the rosin on. Yeah. So it's kind of a time thing. Uh, and it's the yolk? The yellow the part, yeah. The dry With the pure pigment. pigment, yeah. That you mix. Right. Could, could I add one thing here? Yes, yeah. It, it relates to a question that was asked about here, I think that you asked, about whether he has the idea just right off, off the bat. And the analogy that you find in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, where they insist icons are not painted. They never use that expression. They are written because it is an intellectual and a conceptual work as well as a work with paint. And John shared with me one day something I think that fits this very beautifully. He appreciates the, the amount of time it takes. He doesn't get impatient with it because that gives him so much more time to think about and meditate on what he's doing. Because the person is affected by so many things, and sometimes you're not always aware of what is affecting you. And if you are a spiritual person, then you have to discern whether you want to be affected by those things or not. And so it is a conscious decision for you to decide, you know, I'll go with this or... Because you don't do these things alone. And I'm glad about that. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's coming from a place where you couldn't ask for better help from anywhere. Oh, yeah. You know, I, because you can't understand these things. I mean, you... You, you begin working on a thing and you're going through the motions and you don't exactly know why you're going there and yet you're going because you're, something clues you in. And compels you to do it. Yeah. And, and so it's, uh, it is, as she says, not an expression of your own power or your own interest, but one in which you want to convey something about an individual person that has to do with everybody. So it's inclusive and universal, hopefully. Yeah. What's, what's like a Tuesday, like how does a Tuesday look like for you? Like a random day of the week, you start in the morning, have a little coffee, eventually okay. work your way to the studio. Like, you know, Andrew, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with this tradition. In the Catholic Church, we have the days of the week and they, and they match up with certain things. So Tuesday is a day of sorrow. So when I wake up in the morning, I don't have to think about Tuesday. I just know it's a day for sorrow. I don't turn on the radio. I, I put these things in the back of my mind. I, I hate Tuesdays. I hate Fridays. But those are some of my most productive days. Because I'm really coming to grips with something about myself that, you know, is going to happen no matter what. So. It's a, it's a good day, but it's a sad day. <laughs> Every Tuesday, 
About, just about. <laughs> yeah, Ron. So the, the most recent painting in this body of work uh -huh. is, is um, there's something you can share about that and maybe uh, how, how that painting developed? Very good, Robbie, because today in church we learn that the Israelites have been forgiven. So this is a picture of a Jewish man, Gary Goldman. Uh, in the background is a uh, are the Spanish tiles for which the Jews were so famous back prior before prior to the Inquisition where everybody was getting along the Muslims the Jews the Christians an amazing productive time in civilization from those roots Spain went to conquer the world and it was now it everything turned around I mean, there were very few explorers like Cabeza de Vaca who came without some agenda, either to perpetuate some kind of monetary wealth or exact dominion or reduce, you know, indigenous peoples to nothing so that they will accept what we have. Very few of those people, and Cabeza de Vaca was an exception were capable of being ambassadors of something that was true. And he survived because of it. And of course, when he returned to Spain, they put him in prison. So, you know, it just, it gets messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, if, you know, I've spent a lot of time, I went nine months in Spain and I, really, really first received my first vision in Spain. And uh, I, I'm really attached to why they came here and what they did and what happened. Uh, and were we deigned to go someplace we didn't, had never been before, would we be doing the same things that Spain did? Or are we ready to understand a thing and move it out of its place and say, look, apply these things, these tenets to your lives and we're going to go forward with it. What was your question? <laughs> You're close. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Are you capable of doing Nathaniel. Yes. So Nathaniel... Okay, so you're getting back to the early roots when you go back and you're beginning to synthesize the, the people into no longer in the camps. And as Dr. Penn was saying, uh, the roomy thing is, is one of those pictures that's consolidating the traditions of, of a church that's with it and creative full of humor, uh, delightful, incisive, all those characteristics that, that we pray the Lord would be proud of when He returns. Because it's our responsibility. So it's our responsibility to convey those things and to hold each person as a sacred gift. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Have you been a Roman excuse me, a Roman Catholic all your No, just because I married teen I was a Roman Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I was nothing really. And then yeah, then I became an early Protestant and then uh, and then married Tina and became a Catholic, so that's what I am now. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> we went to Rome and we saw the Pope and everything this last Easter. Yeah, it was real cool. Pope Francis? Yeah. I know, he was right there. <laughs> <laughs> we we took the, the images of all the all the pictures of all Bill has one the original book and then there's one other, so we we raise that up, you know, he blesses all your instruments of, what's going call it? And so we got our book blessed, you know, and everything. 
I was so sick that my friend Robert had to do it for me. So oh. we we did get a blitz though. <laughs> <laughs> Yes.